Hi, my name is Hannah Crawford and my pronouns are she, her. My name is Simi J. Patoka and my pronouns are they, them. And we are the Dreaming Divas. Uh, we are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform, but from the perspective of young singers. And today we have the pleasure of chatting with operatic baritone Peter McGillery. We had some really interesting conversations about filming opera, working with regional opera companies, and his radio show, Vocal Point. Before we get into the interview, we would like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki, Neon, Wenseo, and Neutral People. We seek re-indigenization. We stand with the, the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land, and we honor these communities as traditional stewards of these lands. We hope you enjoy the interview. It's a really interesting one. Be sure to check it out and subscribe. Ding! I believe it is actually down. <laughs> I'm going to down. I'm gonna do the down for now. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, would you like to start off with your land acknowledgement? Well, I am happily speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Atikamekshing Anishinaabek and the Whitefish Nation here, otherwise known as Sudbury, Ontario. I'm very grateful to have the chance to live and even sometimes work on these lands and uh, throughout Canada, across, across Turtle Island. It's been the great privilege of my life. So uh, I feel a deep connection with our Indigenous peoples. Um, coming from uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Northern Saskatchewan, of course, is the land of the, the Cree people and uh, many of whom were my very dear friends growing up as a kid. So uh, it, it makes sense to, to acknowledge that we are on a land that is not necessarily uh, ours, but uh, uh, we're not the traditional guardians, but we, we need to take care of it nonetheless. Agreed. Here. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, Peter, we're gonna, we're gonna start this fun time off with a little 60 second life story. Uh, timer is here for your convenience. Oh my Lord. <laughs> feel free to leave in all the good bits. When you feel ready to start, I will click the button and you can go right ahead. Godspeed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, okay. I, I'll get going. Uh, Gosh, uh, born in Saskatchewan in the 1970s. Uh, I won't say which part of the 70s, but uh, the 70s. <laughs> um, eventually moved to Ontario, grew up in Newmarket, went to high school there, and um, went to Huron Heights Secondary School, where I kind of got into school musicals and stuff like that. Uh, my mom was an organist. My dad was a minister. Uh, lots of music in the house growing up, not afraid of being performing and uh, being put in awkward situations. That was part of life. Uh, got to university, definitely didn't want to be a performer. No, couldn't be a performer. Tried to be a doctor, tried to be a lawyer. It didn't work because I kept going into choirs, doing, <laughs> uh, got into all kinds of choir activities, National Youth Choir, Ontario Youth Choir, and finally lost my voice. So I took lessons and then I uh, got into opera school and uh, Canadian Opera Company. And it, I've been working as an opera singer ever since. And I've got two seconds to spare. <laughs> oh, I got married. Oh, there you go. There it is. Ha halfway through, got married. <laughs> Huron Heights School is now an art school, but it wasn't then. It was like the auto shop and uh, cosmetology school. Um, uh, but they had an amazing music program with wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. And I loved growing up there. I found a home with the band nerds and the jazz choir nerds. And I very strongly considered um, going into music originally after I left high school. But oh, you start, I get influenced by the people that, ha that have your ear at certain pivotal times. And right. I had to be convinced that I wanted to be a doctor for my first year. So I did pre-med school and, <laughs> and uh, it was just a disaster. I hated the math. I hated the labs. I just hated it. <laughs> so I ended up, I liked my history and English classes the most. So I ended up doing history and English at U of T. And while I was there, I started singing in choirs, mostly to meet girls. You know, um, it, it makes sense. Me too. It worked. 
the, the straight guy to straight girl ratio is extremely favorable in a choir, university choir. Mm -hmm. um, so it was my, yeah, it, it was my outlet. But it, it be, obviously became a lot more than that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And by my fourth year, I think I was singing in at least two professional choirs. I had a church job, a synagogue job, and three okay. other choirs that I was sort of a ringer for. I remember that year I was I was singing at Christmas time. And I I mean this is like the height of the Messiah Bonanza. Oh yeah, 100%. I'm pretty sure I sang a Messiah every day. Sometimes two from like November 15th to December 23rd. And I lost my voice. I'm not surprised. And somewhere around there, I, I had been in Ontario Youth Choir with, uh, first with Elmer Eisler, the great Elmer Eisler of Elmer Eisler Singers, who you guys won't, won't, unfortunately won't remember, but was kind of a towering genius of Canadian choral music at his day. And Vicki Meredith, if you might have run into at Western, I'm not sure if she would, you would have overlapped with her, but she was kind of one of the choral gurus at, at Western. And Vicki, um, one of my one of my they had teachers there. They had vocal coaches, and they were Lynn Blazer and Daryl Edwards. Oh yes, teaching at Western at the time. Yeah. And I lost my voice and I had really clicked with Lynn Blazer, who was a teacher at U of T at the time. And I just decided, like, can you help me? And she fixed pretty quickly fixed some of my major breathing issues. A lot of things were coming fairly natural, which is good, which is good and bad. Sometimes it's hard to teach somebody who's sort of naturally already singing fairly well, but has some issues they need to sort out. And she said to me at the end of my fourth year, um, I know you're thinking of law school. I know you're thinking of other things, grad school or just taking a year off, but I think you might regret it if you don't um, audition for the music faculty and see how far down the rabbit hole you can go. So I did, and I got in. I did two years undergrad, two years of opera school, then two years of COC ensemble studio. And I've been a professional singer for 18 years now, really up and only until the pandemic hit that I have a break. That's fair, finally. <laughs> Wow. Well, I do know, like, we'll start with some more recent stuff first, yeah. but um, I was really pleased to see that for a cast recording with Tapestry that you guys were a rocking horse winner, which is super exciting. Um, yeah. Would you like to talk more about that? Because recently Tapestry has become kind of the forefront too, especially for more contemporary works and all that. So I would love to hear a little bit about that experience with everybody. Oh, I think, I think Tapestry is been at the forefront uh for a long time actually yeah for 40 years they've been really pushing the envelope yeah exactly sometimes it takes a long time for that envelope to to fill up exactly yeah um but uh there's a lot there's been a lot of really exciting things um people don't it seems ridiculous now but you know 30 years ago you wouldn't you wouldn't see a gay couple on stage that, unless it was like Rosen Cavalier or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not and, and those kind of stories were starting to be told, um, especially when I was coming through school. And they felt new and fresh then. Now, of course, we've got um different other other new kinds of stories stories about people with different cultural experience, different, um, certainly there's a big focus on indigenous content right now that is long overdue. 
mm -hmm. um, anti-colonial, uh, trans things. I mean, there's there's so there's such a wide variety of stories to be explored. And yeah, Tapestry has been there. They've been it's been kind of a home company for me since I came back from Germany around 2007. And we did uh, the, the model of tapestry is really important. Um, it's, it, it's very much unlike some other major companies in the neighborhood uh, who's, who, who have a different, I think, philosophy of how to make creation happen. Yes. Um, whereas other companies might say, hmm, this person's a genius, this person's a genius, let's put them together and make them a work of genius. Tapestry has a, a little more nuanced, um, a, a nuanced process where it begins with speed dating, basically. <laughs> they, take four, they, they take four writers and four composers and four singers, and every two days they have to come up with a new five minute scene. Boom. I love that. Boom. Yeah. And that creates a, you know, like a crisis situation that has to be solved, problems that have to be solved immediately and choices that have to be made because there's a deadline. Photocopies have to be made. Music has to be learned so it can be presented in front of people. Um, and that kind of urgency is really good for the creative process. I think for most, for most artists, deadlines are good for artists. Creative artists need deadlines. And some of the partnerships work, some of them don't. Some of them maybe just didn't have enough time but connections get made and a lot of the operas that you see germinating out of that process come from that off that that uh, libretto lab meetings those those encounters and it, as a singer it's amazing to be part of that to you really get to feel like a creative artist so i was there uh, uh the year that um anna chatterton one of canada's best playwrights i think and uh, Gareth Williams, who's a composer uh, from Scotland. We had two composers from Scotland and two writers from the UK mm -hmm. and two writers and two composers from Canada that year. And they kind of speed dated across, across the Atlantic. And that's how that piece came about. They both loved, they were told to do a ghost story. And they both had remembered this D.H. Lawrence short story from school days. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, you know, they did a little scene out of it and that became something bigger. Wow. And uh, that's, that, that's, I think that's how creation should happen. Like it's, it's nice to have a place where that can happen. And those are very precious. Mm -hmm. so well, I, I've been of... lucky. I, I've been lucky to be a part of that process for a long time. And, and I've done a yeah. lot of really cool premieres and, that's and nice. it's the closest I get to feel like I, I'm really part of the creation process as well, not just the interpretation. Because when you're creating a character that's never been seen before, the world is your oyster and you really get to sink your teeth into it. This is true. It kind of reminds me, we um, we went, uh, Simi and I went and watched the new opera 101 uh, concert that they had at, at like, what was it, two weeks ago, a week ago or something like that? um and it was that same kind of idea like where they they I think the the cast maybe did like two weeks of training a week of training and and like rehearsing for these scenes and they had to learn it in a week it was so cool to me seeing all of that information just come to life and they like limited limited sets but like it made it so much more impactful it was so awesome and it was sold out it was fantastic yeah you don't need much you don't yeah. need much people people want to suspend their disbelief they wouldn't be coming to the opera if they didn't want to suspend their disbelief you know you don't need to hold a gun a gun to to, you know, to suggest that you've got a weapon you know like yeah. um you can do that with your voice mm -hmm. and that's the exciting part of the process uh especially for i find for the writers um and the composers for sure but to allow the music to tell the story. And then for the composers, it's always an amazing experience for them to discover 
I don't have to write this out. Less is more. Let the artist interpret. Let the artist bring their character in. Right. Um, so that's why it's a really it's a really great process that they have there. Um, and we really feel because the composer's there and they want to know what you think, you can give them feedback. Like that note, that is not a comfortable note. <laughs> Did you want that low B to be heard or just kind of great? <laughs> I wish I could um, talk to Mozart, you know what I mean? Was for know, that reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, it's a fascinating process, I think, for everybody involved. Yeah. I love that you were able to work with these people as a singer because, yes, you, you can talk, you can t absolutely talk about like, mm, that note doesn't feel so good, that leading up to. Uh, all that stuff is like important vocally but at the same time too you can actually like put your say into the art itself as well which i think uh what's the word collaboration is how art happens like you can't just create something by yourself because you need the inspiration to come from somewhere well and i can tell you certainly certainly in the case of rocking horse winner i can remember having a few moments where i went to gareth and i said are you sure you wanted that emphasis on the syllable there? Like, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I do. And this is why. Yeah. Oh, okay. I get it. Really wish I could talk to Bartok or, uh, or Strauss or something. Like yeah. That. Don't we all? Is... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, kind of pivoting. So you have worked at pretty extensively on the West Coast with uh, some pretty big opera companies. And you've been, I would say, a regular at a lot of them. How do you foster that relationship and have them uh, kind of keep you on their roster as an artist? Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I, I started with some pretty big advantages in building my career out West and building my career with the regional companies. I, right up until, uh, you know, I, I had a, I had a pretty solid career with the Canadian opera company right up until, um, uh, the, the, the Richard Bradshaw passed away. Uh, I had, I had been singing really regularly with them, but you know, mostly smaller roles and I wanted to do some kind of bigger things and, uh, I had an opportunity. I was lucky. Like, like I, I had name recognition, and because I had won the CBC competition uh, right out of opera school, that got me on the CBC a lot. Because CBC, CBC used to record recitals and concerts. Yeah. Did you know that? And yeah. they used to broadcast them nationally and say your name when you performed. Uh, that used to be a huge advantage that I, I'm not sure whether that window is still open for young artists, uh, but it certainly was still, it was closing, but it was still there. The, co the competition itself shut down. I, after I won, they didn't <laughs> decided to, to cut it a couple of years later. They said it's not getting any better than this. <laughs> well, <laughs> obviously there's a Ben Hepner. Mullerine Forrester, McGilvery. That's yeah, exactly. We got our we've got our winners. Um, no, but uh, but that that was certainly a big help. And then some other competition wins in uh, <coughs> in uh, Montreal. Uh, I came second in Montreal, best Canadian, won a pile of money, which was great. And uh, Norway Oslo Queen Sonia competition that was a big one got me some gigs in Europe, but mostly the Montreal and the uh, CBC competition that, that became, I, I, I was lucky to become, to, to be able to ride that to, to people would return my calls. People would mm. return my emails. Okay. If I email, I was, I, I'm in such and such a city. There's an opera company there. I, I could, I, I was able to say, look, here I am. I don't know if you've heard of me, but I, I was in the COC ensemble. I won CBC competition and Montreal competitions, and I'd like to sing for you. 
Yeah. And they would say, yes. Okay. All right. Um, and that, that was how I got my first regional gig, non-COC gig with Calgary Opera. I had won when I won CBC CBC competition that was in the competition was in Calgary with the CPO. So they already knew me. They invited me back to sing a Carmina Barana. So while I was in town for Carmina Barana, I called up Bob McPhee, the late great Bob McPhee, who was uh, running. Uh, I think he'd just taken over. He just moved from Edmonton symphony to Calgary opera at that time. And I said, I'd like to sing for you. And he's like, well, I don't know if I can have an audition, but I'll come to your Camina Barana rehearsal. And we popped in, we met, I shook hands. We had a laugh. And the next year he hired me to sing Don Cairo in uh, Carmen. So that was my first gig. And that was, I don't know, 2008, 2007, 2006. I don't know. It was a while ago, but that was my first regional gig. I remember it well because I ended up proposing to my wife on the top of Sulphur Mountain in Banff while we were out there for that gig. So uh, I guess I should know the year. It must have been 2007. Wait, 2006. I can't Still remember. Counting. My wife's going to kill me. <laughs> um, but, but that was how I got that gig. Now, most of my work has been with regional companies. And I've been really lucky that I get my third of three, four, sometimes five operas a year with the regional companies. And that has given me a pretty solid middle-class income for about 15 years. Wasn't easy, yeah. never easy. It's not easy to be on the road all the time. I can tell you that. It gets harder, it doesn't get easier. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, most of my work has been out West and then, you know, the, they all come to each other's shows. They see you. You meet them at the party afterwards. You ingratiate yourself. You you try to try to you know perform your best. Sometimes you maybe have a little audition with them, but uh, usually you know they see that you did that role with that company. They're like, well, oh, they can do that role with this company. Ah, yeah. so that's how I got to work in Winnipeg and um, Edmonton and Pacific Opera Victoria and Vancouver Opera and Saskatoon opera even, although I'm sort of being from Saskatoon or the air north of Saskatoon, mm -hmm. I, that, that didn't hurt getting some work with them from time to time. And um, probably my Quebec work came more from the notoriety of uh, winning Montreal competition. Of course, yeah. Because. Uh, uh, Quebec, they tend they tend to hire their own. They have their own star system, and they're try they're actively trying to. Yes, they bring in people from away, especially for specialized roles, but they like to build up their own stars, their own Quebecois stars. Because unlike certain other large opera companies in other parts of Canada, that shall remain nameless, <laughs> I I think they realize that there's value in building relationships with the artists. Exactly. Um, the you know when you're not able to afford actual household names like Bryn Terfel, Renee Fleming, who, Kaufman, like who know you know, like you know you need to build up your own star system, mm -hmm. and people I think gravitate to that. Oh, they just grew up down the road, or they went to. They went to Etobicoke School for the Arts, or oh, they went to Earl Haig, or you know, like there's a there's a hometown hero kind of feel to it. And I think the in Quebec and you know, Montreal and Quebec, they've really glommed onto that idea, and I think it's worked for them to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, not that they're afraid to bring people in from away, but as I said, but most of their people are are homegrown, and for good reason. I think that's the case too, mostly with the regional companies out West. The thing that, the thing why it looks like I only sing out West is because <laughs> we don't have any regional companies in Ontario anymore. We lost Ottawa and we lost Hamilton a few years ago. And I have the dubious distinction of closing down the house in Ottawa. Uh, we were, I was in the 
Barbara Seville production. That was the last one. It was fantastic. It, it was infamous because yeah. not only was it the last show in Opera Lyra's history, on the night of the dress rehearsal, the day of the dress rehearsal, our Figaro, uh, Josh Hopkins, found out that his sister had been murdered. What the heck? In a, in a triple homicide by a boyfriend, ex-boyfriend who had just been let out of jail that day and went down and killed three of his exes. It was horrific horrific and you know we were like josh i think he was so numb that he he just went he was able to do the show because he hadn't really processed everything but if you if if your listeners are interested in that story i would encourage them to go to josh's website i'm sure he has a josh you know joshhopkins.com or something uh, website where he recently ha- had a song cycle written for him by jake heggy and margaret atwood yeah uh called songs for murdered sisters and it's kind of his about his it, there's a there's a lot of processing taking place in that song it's, they did a beautiful filmed version of this cycle with I think Houston Opera it was. Uh, very moving. Highly recommend. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, we're, right. we're, 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 the regional companies are a great place to get your start. And, and, um, and if you're lucky, you can uh, you get to go from town to town, up and down the dial and, uh, and make a living. So basically audition for everything humanly possible and get your name out there. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> um like i don't know if i had this talk with you hannah i don't think we were you were quite quite there yet when we were working together but there is a point as when it, when you're a young artist where you do have to decide that you are a professional mm-hmm. that your services are worth paying for exactly yeah um and that you've had enough exposure, you can die from exposure. Um, and it's time, it's time to really dig in and, and expect payment. Uh, and I think there's a lot of too many, uh, the, the, one, the one thing that's been a bit worrying, I think in, that, in, in the young singer world that I've seen is there's a lot of pay to sing things out there now. And some of them might be worth your time. I don't know. Uh, lots of them aren't. Yeah. And so you have to be really scrupulous. Have some, find some voices that you really trust in your life. Mm-hmm. Some mentors and um, who know the business. Not, and who know the business, how it is, not how it was. Yeah. Fair. Because it's changing. I don't think we fully know what the scope of those these cataclysmic changes that are happening in our business are yeah just hurry up and wait hurry up and wait uh hurry up it's here catch yeah. catch the train get on that freight train it's it chugging away yeah mm-hmm. i've had a i've had an interesting window on the crisis being um on the governing council of of actors equity for the last six years my term just ended and so i've heard a lot of horror stories i've heard a lot of hopeful stories um it sure hasn't been easy and there's a lot of unanswered questions but i think there's some room for optimism as well where there's creative people wanting to do creative things there's always a creative answer i think experience i guess of the last Two years, done, definitely done more work on film than I ever have before. Just um, it's like a new skill, basically. It's it's actually really interesting. Yeah, well, it's also nice. Uh, it, it, it's it's wonderful and it's also horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, I was lucky to to get cast 
in uh, Pacific Opera, Victoria's most recent uh, little film called The Garden of Alice. Elizabeth Rome. Elizabeth Rome, exactly. Mm -hmm. Etsy. And um, starring Tracy Dahl and directed by Glynis Leishon. Go women. Um, and um, Betsy's piece was a lot of fun. Um, and POV just treated us like as much as, as, as amazingly as they could considering all the restrictions. You know, this we filmed that last, it, it, we filmed that in November and December of 2020. Oh, like really? During the height of like Delta, <laughs> never, never mind Omicron. It was Delta or Beta. I don't know. It was just horrible. And so the restrictions were pretty strict at that point. Uh, I had been sitting next to somebody with COVID on the plane ride from Vancouver and ended up having to re-quarantine once we found out. I had already been rehearsing for two days and I had to re-quarantine for a week. Oh my gosh. It was crazy. But, you know, I found acting for the camera so interesting. Like you could fix probably like fix things yeah you're never able to to fix things yeah you can Um, redo yeah (laughs) yeah you can fix things when you're rehearsing but not when you're actually performing so so be all dolled up in makeup and and uh costumes uh and you know we'd we'd already recorded the soundtrack with the orchestra so we were really just lip syncing to to our own to ourselves Mm -hmm. (laughs) so weird so weird so you're performing and you're kind of just yeah i i don't know it was it was a very wacky experience um to have to lip sync to yourself while doing crazy comic um gyrations of all kinds (laughs) alice in wonderland so your larger than life comic book not comic book but cartoon very informed by the cartoon character, contra cartoon version. Fair, so, fair enough. A wow. lot of fun though. Is, but to be able, you know, like it was performing, but it also wasn't performing. Like it's just, yeah. I don't know. So was it streamed, or can we still watch it? You can watch it, but only up till I think March twenty third. Okay. So uh, I think that was the final day. You can you can find a link to it on the the uh, Pacific Opera. Mm-hmm. website i'm sure um but i think they were stopping it as of march 23rd but they might extend it you know i think it was pretty popular i i know my my aunt uh, uh, uh was showing her grandkids the the opera and they loved it they were like they sat still for 80 minutes like even wow. didn't even do that for encanto <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice it's a cute uh very i think it's a it's a beautiful story well told so i was happy to be a part of it i was certainly happy for the work in 2020 i bet uh, that after was everything i was a godsend mm-hmm. yeah. because after that everything shut down again i lost all of my work for 2021 um you know when you're a young artist and you see an empty schedule your head you're like oh well, things will come you know like i guess you still kind of have to think that when you're an older artist but you have things like mortgages yeah uh you know i don't have them but you know there are you, you you know a lot of my colleagues my age have kids you know and Most commitments of and yeah. loan payments and car payments and like the pressure to maintain a steady financial income is huge. And to have that just wiped out for an entire year is traumatic. So I, I think I did what a surprising number of, I think you'd be surprised how many opera singers, despite the face bragging, despite the, the Instagram uh spots i i think most singers got muggle jobs yeah um and that's what i did i worked i worked for the post office for the first six months i'm not ashamed of this to say that 
No, it's a good gig. I mean, that's um, I know a lot of my music and, friends did that too. And, and I've been working for Service Canada, helping people with their unemployment claims for uh, <coughs> uh, since about June of 2021. Mm-hmm. And I'm taking off leave to um, to go and sing. Yeah, in Vancouver, it's pretty exciting. The nice thing about government jobs is there's always someone there to take over for you if you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to find a sub. Exactly. <laughs> if they only knew. If they only knew what I had to do. <laughs> it so I know. Nice. It's like whenever I have to get a cover at my work, I'm like, um, too bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that being said, so I know this is more of a recent-ish project for you, but you've been doing a show on 96.7 for Vocal Point, yeah. which I was able to listen to a couple of them a couple of weeks ago, but oh. how, did, how did that start out? Like, what, where did it come from? That was actually, it was an idea that I had before the pandemic. I had done a... I had done a, a show for our local CK, CKLU is our local yeah. uh, university radio station, as Hannah will know, being a Laurentian or a, a Cambrian grad. It um, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, it's our local community radio. It's technically, you know, part of the university still, but it's a community station. And they were having a fundraiser, and I did a show for them just my. These are a few of my favorite things kind of thing, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for their fundraising week. And I really enjoyed it and they seemed to enjoy it. So I had a meeting with the station manager short, maybe shortly before the pandemic started to come down. And I was like, yeah, I'd like to, I think I'd like to start a show. And I was like, well, what do you want to call it? Well, I don't know. So I put it on Facebook and I said, what, are, what should I call my show? And they're all kinds of, there are all kinds of terrible ideas. And um, Rick Phillips, who uh, is a Facebook friend of mine, I used to sing with his wife in a choir. Um, Rick Phillips used to have a show on CBC for many years called Sound Advice, where he reviewed classical recordings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that show. And Rick, Rick said, I always, I always wanted to have a vocal music show and call it Vocal Point. So I said, I'm stealing that, if that's okay with me. <laughs> it's my idea. Because I think that's an excellent play on words. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I got the name from, from Rick. Thanks. Hat tip Thanks, from, Rick. Uh, Rick. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, it's been something that, uh, obviously, then the pandemic hit, and I, you know, university facilities were closed off to the world, so I wasn't able to actually learn, go in and learn how to use the equipment. Uh, at the studio, but I think we've all become kind of semi experts in home audio and video production over the past two years. And so I've sort of built my skills up and I've been trying to do at least a weekly show for the past two years. And it's been really fun. I, it's helped me feel like a creative artist to sort of, you know, pick through. You know, I love that was one of the things I especially loved about when I was younger and doing a lot more recitals um, is curating programs and crafting programs and to have the restriction of, okay, I've got 58 minutes of no commercials. I've got to get a few little promos in and that's what I've got. Uh, what can I possibly do in that? And, you know, let's have a theme for each show uh, or let's pick a country. I'm trying to do, Opera, Broadway, jazz, choral, trying to fill a bit of a void maybe in, uh, of course. in the local radio scene, but I also just like to play music that I like <laughs> or that I'm really just getting obsessed. So it, it's it's been great. I've get, I get to dig out my old, uh, you know, my, uh, my, oh. my Grove Dictionary of Opera that a friend of mine bought for me from Cost of Oxford University. These days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get to dig out all these little reference books and crack them open and uh, do research. Kind of felt, I kind of had lots of nostalgia, student nostalgia, but just it's been a really nice creative outlet. I gotta say, it's fun, and I like playing. And I like it's like having that. I like taking the. I like. I don't know. My mother has uh, has been suffering from increasing dementia over the past few years, and so uh, I really like sending her the 
sending her the masters or sending the masters to my dad and he plays it for her and she can, I can I'm there in the room with her even when she's isolated in, in Guelph. I really wanted to talk about your coaching and teaching style because I knew um, so we started working together when I was about 18. So like pre having any kind of knowing what to do with my voice. <laughs> um, and it was super helpful to me to have someone who wasn't necessarily like a, at the time a voice teacher, but more of a coach is always how I thought our time together was like, it was somewhere, someone to bounce your ideas off of someone who is not necessarily as invested in your voice and hasn't been with you from the beginning like my previous teacher was things like that and I know now that you teach at Laurentian as well and you have at Cambrian before too so I would love to talk a little bit about your teaching style as well because it was super beneficial to me in my early stages so I would love to chat about that well it's nice of you to say thank you very much for kind words um yeah I I, I was definitely uh, experimenting with you when when we were coaching uh i hadn't coached a lot of female voices mm-hmm. uh up at, up to that point so i was learning a lot too well you're I'd welcome mainly <laughs> been coaching some some mostly baritones and tenors and uh and sort of helping them get prepped for their university educations and and further studies but um so I was certainly learning as well at that point, but I've got a little bit more experience now. It certainly hasn't been my major focus of my activities, but it's something I definitely think about. It's something I think I'd like to pursue uh, increasingly as, as and, and maybe dovetail with my performing career if I'm, if, you know, after the pandemic, we're able to resume it to the same level. Mm-hmm. I think that's still a question. But uh, I do, I do love teaching. I love, I love exploring the voice. As far as a philosophy, I, I'd probably say I'm still developing one, but um, very broadly, I, 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 uh, I worked with Timothy Noble very memorably in when I was with the Canadian Opera company and uh and he was a he's an amazing baritone and a professor at um uh indiana university in bloomington Mm -hmm. and the jacob school of music and he was very influential on me um in terms of finding your natural your most natural sound um making every note beautiful even Mm. the ugly one um but but also really singing singing where where your speaking voice is finding your character and heightening that with supported with the with supported breath but still keeping it in, in terms of its placement where your speaking voice is so that your voice is recognizably you. When people yeah. are casting, when people are casting, you know, there, there, there may be some roles where you're really just seeing whether they have the note. <laughs> like, you know, can they sing the high C in, can they sing the five C, high C's in, uh, uh, <laughs> in Pura Mon Am? Uh, can, uh, can they sing König in der Nacht and be reasonably in tune? Um, <laughs> But I think for the most part, people are people are hiring your character. Mm. So at the same time as you're building your voice and learning your craft and your technique and how to massage all those passaggios together, mm-hmm. so they sound nice and blended. Um, you need to be also developing your character and your sense of taste. And that's that, that I that I think is what sets the young artists that that really grab your ear and your eye apart. Yeah. Is someone who's got something to say. Um 
someone who's going through the motions and they're just singing Bach because it's just like a technical vocalese for them, um, they're really not going to get my vote. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll probably vote that off the island, given it a chance. I want to, I want to be entertained. I want to be charmed. I want to be frightened. I want to be engaged with. And and too many young singers, I think, focus solely on the voice and those vocal elements, and they freeze up. <laughs> it's so stiff. Um, because they're they're thinking of all those technical elements, which are important. There's no denying that. Um, you know, m so much of my early vocal edu and lyrical education <laughs> is uh, m consumed with mortal fear of singing a high G. Um, I get it. And approaching high Gs, and that one high F sharp in. Uh, the counts area and figure out you know that you know i think i think equally important along with those high notes or those low notes or all the notes in between is that sense of finding a character that is you that sounds like you your unique self being a character yeah. You know, and it, it's interesting too, because I think at the time when we worked together, I wasn't thinking it in those terms because you very, you very stealthily hit it because you knew where I was going, but you're like, don't freak her out too much yet. But you still got the idea across in the first place. And looking back on it now, I was like, oh, like, I know what you're trying to do. Like, I get it now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, well, also though, you know, in terms of pedagogically, speaking though you you want to be careful particularly with young singers that you're not um that you're not interfering with what they're with with the program to that they're getting from their primary teacher your primary yes. teacher is your primary teacher and when you're a coach there's a limit to what you want to say about about their production about about the deepest elements of their technique you know the base elements. You don't want to screw with it. It's mm -hmm. not. It's 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 not your turf. And I think that's that's also true when you're if you're adjudicating uh, something. You know, like you need to talk about the big the big ideas. And for me, whenever I'm adjudicating or coaching somebody else's student, um, I'm looking for the things that I can say that's not going to interfere. And that is always, I can always find things to say about character. Always. Yeah. Because it's, it's all, it's always the most ignored element. Yeah. Because you're so worried about the, all the other things. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, you need, you need to make every note beautiful, even the ugly ones, but you also need to deliver them with panache so you're engaged. I feel like so many of the of the phrases you said today need to go on a t-shirt, like they're in my memory bank, you know? <laughs> we'll get Dreaming Divas t-shirts with like Peter McGill requotes on it. Exactly. Um, well, Peter, we'd like to finish off with, um, uh, this, is, this is a question that we like to ask everybody. And it is, what is your why? Why do you continue to sing? Why do you get up every morning and practice, work for the government, do all of these things? What's it all for, for you? Wow, that's, um, that is perhaps the biggest question that I think every artist has been asking themselves every hour and every day for the past two years, especially. Okay. Usually that was the kind of question that you come back to maybe once every few months in your deepest, darkest moments where you're waiting to hear back from an audition or something. But um, goodness, uh, I sing because I can do no other. To 
to crudely paraphrase Martin Luther. Um, here I sing. Uh, I quickly realized, I think in university, my first year, my first year of university, I didn't do very much music. And I had been doing lots of music. I, my life had been, my life in high school had been consumed with music. My life as a child had been consumed with music, piano lessons, uh, church choirs, church music, uh, <laughs> tuba lessons, like everything. And we had a piano at home, always in motion. Mom playing, my sister playing, me playing, my dad playing. Um, organs. We had, we had a pump organ in the, in the basement that we used to fool around with as kids. The stereo was always going. CBC stereo was always on all hours of the day in the kitchen. We were always, we were surrounded by music. And my first year of university was, I, 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 there was a lot of growing up that happened. But I thought I wanted something else. And I started on a path towards something else. And it drew me back. I couldn't get away. I love, I, I needed that music in my life. It filled a void um, that I don't think anything else could. And um, yeah. Anytime I kind of get a little low, I, 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 it's be, it's often because I'm 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 alienated from the source, from the music, from making it, from listening to it, from consuming it. It's very easy. It's been easy throughout this pandemic to get depressed, um, and I go to a place without music. Especially now, we're looking at. The situation in Ukraine, 24, 24 hours of just really bad news. I had to take a step back the other day, mostly because my wife pointed it out, as she often does, and do some deep listening, and going back to the source. And, and the radio program has certainly been, been helpful for that. My why is because I have to. My how is because I need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's that's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Do you uh, do you think we have some time left over for a couple rapid fire questions? Sure. Go ahead. Awesome. Hannah, did you want to start us off? I do. I'm I'm picking them at random. They're in a mug. Me too. Okay. <coughs> Oh, I think I might know the answer. We already talked about it. Favorite composer to sing? Go. Oh. Verdi. Oh, okay. Yep. Same. Always Verdi. Um, that one doesn't apply to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a question we had asked Leslie Fagan. and it was favorite garment you had ever sewn. I don't know if oh, you yeah. Do you sew? I think I think I've replaced some buttons in the past, but I don't think, I'm certainly not up to Leslie Fagan standards. <laughs> then I will ask: um, Do you have a guilty pleasure or bad habit you'll never break? Oh, musical or non-musical? There. Oh gosh, I have so many bad oh bad God. habit, bad musical habits. Um, Bad music. Yes, I have lots of bad musical habits. I'll talk about those. <laughs> I am an incorrigible crooner. Coming off the voice, making it precious. Not always good in opera. Uh, sausage singing. And testing the, you know what I mean by sausage singing? Like going, wah, 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 wah. My favorite. Yep. And uh, not starting off each note with vibrato. What's the most recent thing you've learned? Anything. How to sew a button. <laughs> no, I learned that. I learned that very young. I got my sewing badge actually in uh, Wolf Cubs back in the day. I love that. Um, 
Oh gosh, most recent thing I learned. Uh, okay, uh, well, I'll say this. I learned that um, orange cats, of which I have one, he hasn't made an appearance yet, but he, he still might. Um, orange cats uh, were beloved by the Vikings. And anywhere the Vikings had a presence of whether it be of the raping and pillaging kind or the staying and settling kind, uh, there is a preponderance of orange cats. So Scandinavia, obviously, the British Isles, Normandy, Sicily, Apulia, anywhere there are Normans or Vikings, there are more orange cats than other kinds of cats. There you go. That is interesting. That is interesting. Isn't I didn't it? know that. So it's very interesting. Um, describe yourself in three words. Thoughtful, diplomatic, charismatic. I love it. <laughs> okay. Hopefully. Oh, I, I want to know. What's your party trick? Do you have, not singing, obviously. I love to tootle out my harmonica, but um, yeah, I don't have any like weird like double joints or anything. Other than like kind of a wonky thumb. Yeah. Um, I think Simi's just impressed you played the harmonica. Harmonica is so hard to learn. I've tried several times. That is impressive. <coughs> it is a. If I had it downstairs, and the other I would have pulled it out. <laughs> Next time, you're coming back. Hold on, hold on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we got a show. Oh Catch you here, folks. Free Peter McGillery show. I'm so excited. It is so hard to learn. It is. I've really seriously tried a couple times. It is difficult. Oh, what a breath. <laughs> Did I mention I just had COVID? Yeah. <laughs> Clean the harmonica. Yeah, seriously. Oh my lord. I think I need that to put was so some, impressive. I think I need to put some ventolin in there or something. Just attach it to the end. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Or maybe um, some like crushed up Xanax. I don't know. <laughs> um, what is your favorite role? Ah, uh, it's usually the role that I'm doing. I'm lucky. I, I get to do ridiculously fun characters mm -hmm. now that I've kind of transitioned into specializing in them. So uh, certainly love Bartolo. Don Magnifico in Cenerentola is, is uh, a fave. Um, <coughs> I'd say ambition-wise, I still would love to do a Falstaff. I would love to hear that's, you. And that's that. my, uh, yeah. das ist mein Traumrolle. Uh, um, and then I would love to join you in that production. <laughs> we'll make it best. happen. It's the greatest. The greatest gift the old man ever gave us. True. It's true. Ah, I wish. Ah, one day. Anyway, um, introvert or extrovert? Oh, that's a good question because most people would say I'm an extrovert, but I have a, I have an I have a hermit side too. Okay, I like it quiet. I can be I can be alone all day with, uh, and that's not just because I spend a lot of time on the road. I even before I I can spend all day obsessing about like one thing and just learning all I can about it. Wow, and not talking. I think I would go crazy. <laughs> so I, I kind of, I kind of vacillate between the two. I guess. Yeah, that's Vacillate. Fair. Um, what is the best advice you were ever given? Um, can I do two? Yeah, sure. Why not? Both involve musicians grabbing me by the lapels and shaking me 
Um, the first was uh, Martin Katz. Um, if you know Martin Katz, the, the uh, famous collaborative pianist and teacher mm -hmm. at University of Michigan. Um, played for literally every American singer ever. Um, <laughs> I remember we finished, we finished our, uh, my, our time at Ravinia Festival when I was singing there and he grabbed me and said, always sing with vibrato. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> and, um, and then probably the, my, my second favorite was my first trip to the UK, the great tenor, Anthony Rolf Johnson. He really just took me aside and very earnest, earnestly said, if you don't continue on with this, I shall never forgive you. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, Peter, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, can you tell the listeners where they can find out more information about you? <laughs> well, if they want to, I guess. Um, yeah, I, my Peter McGillivray, P-E-T-E-R-M-C-G-I-L-L-I-V is in Victor, R-A-Y dot com. That's where I uh, put most of my uh, gigs and, uh, and uh, other information about my career and, and um, I'm obviously on Facebook and Twitter and all those kinds of things. And I always love hearing from singers and especially young singers looking for, for a bit of guidance. I'm, I'm happy to provide what little knowledge I've earned. Do it. Hit, it about, hit him up. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Nice to talk to both of you. And we are the Dreaming Divas. <laughs> I hated that. I hated that. We have to restart. <laughs> restart. I did. <laughs> oh, that was embarrassing. Okay, I understand why you like just say the Dreaming Divas now because that is uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. I'll do something. It won't be that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And scene. All on you. You got it.